Brahmins. And I said, is this, is this some kind of a southern Brahmin plot to get Punjabis on both sides of the border to incinerate each other so, so they can rule this important? <laughs> so, Mr. Subramanian was up to it. He said, see, Shekhar, if we had left it to you, Punjabi, so you would have already incinerated yourselves. <laughs> so you know, that is something that I, I remember always. So he, he didn't jump on the defensive. How can you say so? So and so, just eat so also a hawk. And he's not a uh, Tamil Brahmin. He didn't say that. He was, he was quite, uh, he, he rose to the occasion, uh, if I may say so. Uh, two more, uh, one more, two more uh, stories. One directly concerning him and one not directly concerning him, concerning him but one that made me think of him. Uh, there was a time during Mr. Gujral's short prime ministership that India decided to sign the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, at that point, one evening, Mr. Gujral called some of us, I think about four or five senior edit editors, and he said, look, you people sit down here, I want to tell you something. We've signed the Chemical Weapons Convention. Tomorrow, I've called you to take you into confidence because, you know, otherwise you will say, what is it India is now giving away, away its nuclear weapons? Or India is giving away the option of building nuclear, uh, sorry, uh, chemical weapons. The fact is, we always had chemical weapons. We never told anybody about it, but chemical weapons were there. Now that we signed the convention, inspectors will come. We are turning over our chemical weapons. And this, we are making clean breast of it. So this is a settled thing. It's, it's fine. And he explained it to us. So in, fact, so, in fact, I mentioned to him, I said, look, we just signed a, an agreement with the Pakistanis a couple of years back in which we said none of us had chemical weapons. So how did we do that? So he said, look, Shekhar Ji, this uh, country, the biggest thing in this country, this country's beauty is that the secrets that are kept here are kept here. He said that the big, big secret in this country is all kept, no one opened them. And he said that the Nehru, Rajiv Gandhi and Indra Gandhi were very big people. And it was his humility. He said that there are very small people who have become a Pradhan Mantri. I'm not sure that Andrzej would have agreed. He said that there are very small people who have become a Pradhan Mantri. In fact, he said that there are very small people who have become a Pradhan Mantri. But still, there are never any of them. Later in a conversation with... Mr. Subramaniam, I suddenly thought that here is a man who's most certainly been privy to every secret worth keeping in the security history of this country. And in fact, every secret worth revealing in the security history of this country. Now, even if you look at America where secrets are often kept, almost anybody who had any secrets feels tempted and in fact considers it his duty at some point of time to reveal many of those secrets in, in a memoir, in an autobiography, in an interview. These days you have, uh, you have recorded verbal uh, uh, autobiographies. But here was a man who never ever felt that temptation. In so many of my conversations with him, and I'm sure many of you, unless you were already privy to those secrets, found that he could keep a secret as almost nobody would which was uh, something that I realized, in fact, subsequent to that conversation. And third uh, is the only time when I made an appearance before him. I was summoned by the Kargil Inquiry Committee in Loknayak Bhavan. Uh, and I must say we had a sl slightly, uh, not acrimonious, but an argumentative uh, exchange there. Because I said certain things, which I shall not say who, but which, is, which did not find an immediate uh, agreement with the members of the Cardinal Committee. And among the things I said was that I heard from one very important and a very successful and senior army officer involved in Cargill operations that he thought that the skill levels of the average Pakistani soldier were higher than those of the average Indian soldier. And I said maybe uh, we've lost out on something in our training. Maybe our forces have been too busy doing other things. And this is, a, uh, and I tried to elaborate it. And it started some kind of an argument. And I found on the side, he was doing this to me. It's almost like uh, an, a parent telling a child to shut up. Uh, affectionately saying, this is not the place to get into this argument. 
So this was over. Uh, a week later, uh, I got a resume of my conversations with the Cargill committee, which I did not agree with. Uh, so I wrote back to the Cargill committee, and I said, this is not what, what I said. This is not a faithful uh, account of what I said. If you so wish, uh, I am willing to write to you uh, what I had said. And I was told, forget it, uh, we perhaps don't need it, or something like that. So it was forgotten. And one day I ran into Mr. Subhamanyam, he took me aside. He said, now sit with me. Tell me exactly what was this man saying. Why did he say so? Give me examples. I said, sir, but you didn't want me to say this there, and you were doing this to me. He said, no, 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 not everybody needs to know. Not everybody can do something about it. And the place for observations like this is not an inquiry committee report which will be leaked to all you guys. So, so he said, I'm willing to listen to you. And this is very important. I'll make sure it goes to the right quarters and pro probably something is done about it. So, you know, uh, this, was, this was another lesson that, you know, he was always an establishment man. And I say that in a very positive sense, Jay. Uh, there's no government, no political party, I think, if there's one man who's responsible for keeping India's national security policy, India's largest strategic worldview, so bipartisan, it was him. Because he was the common thread between all policy-making establishments in India, and everybody trusted him. That's why even when he spoke out on the nuclear deal, in support of the nuclear deal, nobody suspected his motives. Uh, in fact, nobody could even question him intellectually. And he gave the same explanation as he gave to others about, about the landscape changing. So I do remember, uh, he once called me. It's, it's a, if he called me, it was usually to say, this is happening, and you should either do this, or I'm sending you an article, or you should get so-and-so to. He didn't call for no reason, ever. Uh, but I got a call once. He had seen an interview I'd done with Narsimha Rao, in which I had asked Narsimha Rao, uh, Narsimha Rao said, in a country like India, I had to make a U-turn on Indian economy. But in a country like India, you cannot ever be seen to be making a U-turn. So I said, sir, then how does Mr. Narsimha Rao make a U-turn without making it look like he's making a U-turn? So he thought for a while, and he said, bhai, aise hai, ke suppose the ground under you is moving. <laughs> now, I thought that was a brilliant line. My TV producer thought, sir, kya boring wo bol raha hai, itna lamba la, wo baas samaj nahi aa rahi hai. But when the interview was published, the text was published, the same morning I got a call from Mr. Subramanyam, and he says, see, that's a wise man. What a brilliant thing he has said. Suppose the ground under you is moving. That's precisely what's happening on India's security situation. So I think that was his great quality. You know, he's somebody who was not, who was not a prisoner of his own old lines. He was willing to change the lines, he was willing to change the script, and such was his force of intellect and, uh, and his moral strength that all of us then tended either to follow or argue with it, but always, always took him seriously and never, never questioned his motives. So I would say that as, uh, as you would say, uh, it's not often said in India about people, a great Indian, a great patriot, a great intellectual, a free mind and a pakka establishment man. You know, Jay, I was smiling, but I cannot, uh, you know, we had a little laugh in our office one day, and we were thinking, has it ever happened in the history of our paper that we had three generations of the same family figure in our paper on the same day? I think you were quoted, or we had your picture in, at some uh, event. Uh, we had your son's article, and we had your father's article on the same day. So no, that is one thing we will miss, but maybe we'll make up for it someday by publish, republishing one of his old articles. In fact, we will come back to you to check if you can collect the articles that he's written for the Express and publish them in a commemorative volume. Thank you very much. I'm very privileged to be here. I don't deserve to be on this stage, but I'm, now that I'm here, I, I'll take it. Thank you very much. Mr. Subramaniam, Honorable Vice President, 
members of the family, friends. Uh, to begin with, allow me to read a, a message from the Prime Minister, from Dr. Manmohan Singh. Uh, he wanted very much to be here and asked me to read this. In Kesubaranyam's passing, India has lost one of its most original thinkers, and I have personally lost an advisor and friend. In his many years of service to the nation, Kesubaranyam set the highest standards of intellectual effort and equity, and showed an ability to anticipate and guide our national discourse on security issues in the broadest sense. That he did so as a realist was in itself remarkable at that time. That he combined his realism with a strong sense of moral purpose and the values that drive our policy, our polity, make his contribution timeless. The best tribute that we could pay to this remarkable Indian would be to maintain the intellectual rigor and probity that marked his long years of service to the nation. I will miss his wise counsel in the years to come. My heartfelt condolences to his wife and family. May God give them the strength to bear this great loss. And if I may say a few words myself, uh, I think you've just heard a remarkable range of, of eloquent tributes to Sri K. Subramaniam. And people have spoken about his human qualities, about all that he did for India to actually give us a vision of what we could be as a strong, secure state. Uh, I mean, the, the range of issues is really remarkable. India, I think, was probably the only nuclear weapon state which evolved into a nuclear weapon state and had a doctrine to go with it. The others made it up as they went along thereafter. And that's thanks to K. Subramaniam, actually, that he had actually thought this through and he gave us a framework in which to deal with this. And that's only one instance. But I mean, whether you look at his work in the JIC when he taught us actually how to handle intelligence in the uh, establishment that Shekhar was just speaking of, uh, in the IDSA where he taught us all how to think, actually, the Kargil Review Committee, which is really the origin of the national security structures that we have today. I mean, it's hard to think of an area connected with India's national security which was not the result directly of that mind. Uh, but I would like to speak of him as somebody much younger saw him. I mean, I first saw him in 72 and, as usual, got into an argument with him. Uh, he, he was telling us, I remember in 72, what was not received wisdom then, that you didn't have to choose between guns and butter, that defense expenditure was actually good for development. This was absolute heresy in those days, you remember. He was the only one who, who would ever make that argument. But what amazed me was that he was willing to listen to a 23-year-old and to actually deal with each argument and treat it with respect. And for me, that was the real lesson throughout my dealings with him, that he was incisive, he had a mind which was clearly superior, but there was no ego attached to that. He was quite willing to actually listen to what you said to him. And that is what made him a true teacher. Uh, people have used words like Bhishma Pitama, called him our strategic guru. I think none of them actually describe I remember going through two years in the JIC. It gives you an idea of how lowly the JIC was when they used to send undersecretaries like me in 77. <laughs> but it was also a school. It was where he taught us to peel facts, layer by layer, like an onion, to reveal new layers of meaning and what you could actually do with intelligence. And that really is where many of us learned our craft in those years. Uh, these are things that, you know, we seldom speak about. And, but it is important. This is how you build an establishment. Because ultimately that's what an establishment is. A group of people who know how to think, who know how to apply their mind, 
and who are in a sense self-replicating. And that is what K. Subramanian really was. He was the man who helped us, helped to create a national security establishment in India. The other aspect which I think ran through many of the tributes was his tremendous intellectual honesty and the moral purpose that he brought to this. I mean, he never let you forget that this was not just security for law and order's sake or that it was always for a purpose. It was for the development of India. It was for the people of India and that there were values that underlay this, whether it was democracy, whether it was pluralism, and that it was not just power for power's sake that we were dealing with. At one level, he was, he was a prophet. And I think that for many years to come, we will keep turning back to him. The, one of the last emails I got from him was a set of articles that he was working on, four of them. And he said uh, that I don't think I'll be able to finish these. My health will not permit me, but th these are for you. Uh, and when I looked at it today, it's a grand strategy for the whole century. <laughs> uh, only K. Subramanian could have done that. Uh, thank you. I think the best way to honor his memory, really, is to try in whatever inadequate way we can to do what he did, which is, as I said, to use our minds fearlessly but without ego for the higher purposes that he worked for, to build a strong, secure, and prosperous India. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, I'm sure that many of you knew my father personally, and perhaps some of you did not. Uh, but in any event, uh, it's something which uh, all of us in the family uh, much appreciate. I want to spend uh, <clears throat> these few minutes in two sets of uh, remarks, uh, related remarks. One of a more uh, personal order and one perhaps of a slightly less personal order, but nevertheless uh, related to the first set of remarks. My father was a very interesting father. Uh, he liked babies. But then when the babies grew up a little bit, uh, he had a little bit more difficulty connecting with them. And so I think all of us had a very interesting sort of two-part relationship with him. One which was something which we probably knew but had forgotten which is how we related to him when we were very young. I think some of you who saw the photographic show here uh, would have had some sense of that. And then we all reconnected with him. We reconnected with him, usually in our teens, and certainly in our adulthood. And in our teens, or as we were getting into adults, my father's mode of dealing with us was as if we were small adults. Uh, so his typical mode of dealing with us was uh, the conversation, the argument, the dining room seminar, which uh, Babu Parsati referred to, but uh, actually more than the morning, it was the evening, because we never saw my father much during the day. So uh, we used to have these, these arguments, and actually uh, these arguments were how we got to know him. We got to know him as someone you argued with, as someone who knew for a very long time more about almost any subject under the sun than you did. And uh, of course, little by little, we all gained a little advantage in some area or the other so that we could at least out-fact him, if not out-argue him, in some matters. So that's how we eventually you know, came to relate to him. And I think we found him as a sort of, uh, uh, coming into adulthood, we came into our own in our, in our dealings with him, in a way in which I think uh, we didn't as we were children. As we were children, I think uh, we were our mother's children in, in, in many respects. Um, now, um, actually it's true, uh, I should mention in passing that I think one of the very few occasions in which my father actually ever said uh, something about us as babies was, uh, he said something about feeling like us, like a cat feels about kittens. It's a very odd expression he used. 
uh, very <laughs> evocative at a certain at a certain level. Now, um, when we came to see him as an adult, of course, we understood straight away that he was an intellectual. Uh, by the way, I don't I believe my father was an academic. He wasn't an academic. Probably he was better off not being an academic. But he was an intellectual. And he was an interesting kind of intellectual. And uh, that's what I want to actually spend a few minutes thinking about. And partly I have to say that uh, that thought comes uh, also from seeing uh, this film uh, that my niece uh, made and which some of you saw at the beginning. I realized... Uh, See, on seeing this film, and in fact, uh, it brought back a lot of conversations with my father, that he was actually um, an autodidact in many respects. Uh, he was an autodidact who, as he said, uh, he uh, was never completely comfortable in the English language. He was actually someone who grew up in Tamar, though eventually he acquired a strange relationship with Tamar, moving between Tamar and English. But uh, he was an autodidact. He was a sponge for facts. Uh, he read very widely, somewhat indiscriminately probably when he was young. He listened. He listened obsessively to news uh, on the radio. Uh, we didn't have a television until the late 80s. And then after he got the television, as my sister once pointed out, you know, you could put him in a hotel room and so long as it had BBC and CNN, he could sit there for 24 hours just absorbing the news. So he was an autodidact, but he was also an autodidact in the way in which he conceived the world. Um, he was not one of those people who came to grand conceptual frameworks from other people. Uh, once uh, my friend uh, Jean Drez, uh, the development economist, asked me, uh, did your father read game theory? Uh, did he actually, for example, read uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern, or for, actually Anatole Rappaport was the reference he gave me. It's true, we have these books in our house, but I don't think that my father was actually very influenced by them. I think he came to all of these things on his own. He was actually a kind of, uh, if I dare say so, a kind of a vernacular intellectual in his, own, in his own right, who made up things as he went along. Now, what did this actually mean? What this meant, of course, was, uh, I think it explains a little bit of his uh, flexibility, of his capacity to adapt. And it also actually takes me to something which uh, he was very tickled by. It was mentioned um, by Mr. Menon that... Uh, some people called him the Bhishma Pitama. He was also sometimes called the Indian Chanakya, by, uh, typically by the Pakistani press, actually. Now, let me just remind you of one, of things about, uh, one or two things about Chanakya. Uh, remember that we didn't actually have his great text, the Arthashastra, in a complete form until the early 20th century when it was recovered. This is the historian in me coming out. Um, but he was a remembered figure. And throughout the medieval period and the 16th and 17th and 18th century, if you go to any text, any court in India, they're always talking about something called Chanakyaniti or Chanuraniti or Kautilyam, which are actually not uh, a reference necessarily to the text, but to an attitude, to a way of looking at the world, to a way of conceptualizing the world. And if you actually uh, think about it, one of the reasons why when people lament, as some people have lamented even to me, the absence of an Indian strategic thought, I think people have looked in the wrong place. It's not in Sanskrit you find it. You find it in the Indian vernaculars. And I think that that's the reason why, when I think of myself as a vernacular, uh, of my father as a vernacular intellectual, not myself, of my father as a vernacular intellectual, I think that's what he came from. He came from a kind of a, a, kind of a popular conceptualization, a popular tradition of looking at these matters without excessive theoretical baggage, with an enormous capacity to process and digest facts, enormous capacity to adapt, move with the times, um, but always uh, keeping in mind this kind of, uh, what some people have called realism. But let me just actually uh, close with a remark on the question of realism. You know, um, one of the best ways in which you can come to understand somebody's in terms of their taste for music. And my father had a very interesting taste in music. You heard some of it if you came in early. Uh, he, of course, liked what a lot of people in his generation liked, M.S. Subhulakshmi. He liked uh, Lata Mangeshkar. Uh, he liked uh, strange things. He liked the theme music from Dr. Zhivago. Well, if you add it all up, what you can actually see is something which I think all of us in our family knew, and perhaps some of you outside the family knew, 
which is my father was a very sentimental man. <clears throat> he had some difficulties sometimes <coughs> expressing the sentimental side, but he was a sentimental man. And the <coughs> fact of the matter is that when you come to what his realism was, his realism makes no sense in the absence of sentiment. And uh, I think that finally, if you take away uh, uh, the sort of sentimental side of him, which includes patriotic sentiment, but which includes other kinds of sentiment, I don't think you can deploy a realism unless you actually have it as a means to an end. And the end itself is not given to you by that realism or whatever it was. Coming back to the history, we actually don't know who Kautilya, if he ever existed, I and mean, it's not somebody's fiction, who he worked for. I, we don't certainly believe today he worked for the Mauryan dynasty. The difficulty with this text is we can't even divine who he worked for. The purpose of Machiavelli, of course, was also that it could be applied anywhere and implied loyalty to nobody. I think my father knew where his loyalties were. You may not agree with them, but he knew where they were. He was a man of sentiment, but I think he concealed that sentiment. And I think there's some point sometimes to concealing sentiment rather than being merely creatures of emotion. I think that's what makes us human beings, and I think that that's what my father understood to be his role as a human being. Thank you. Honorable Vice President, sir, ladies and gentlemen, a very distinguished audience, it remains for me to thank all of you for being with us this evening. But as the tributes were growing, there were a couple of requests that came in. I had to get up a couple of times. I received some text messages on my phone. And I apologize to those whom I have not been able to invite and give you an opportunity to share your thoughts. But I will make one minor sort of acknowledgement, if I may. As many of you are aware, Mr. Subramaniam took to technology around the time that he was in the task force, if I may say so. I think those of you here may be aware that in 2005, the Prime Minister had nominated him as Chairman of the Task Force on Global Strategic Developments. And that's when I was working with him in a sort of ship's cat manner. And that was the internet time, and we put Mr. Subramaniam in front of the computer, and he very quickly got on top of that, and he had a great I would say, cyber community with whom he used to interact in his own way. And some of them designate themselves as cyber chelas. And I have received a number of messages and mails. I don't think I would have the time to sort of really go into the detail. But today we are on live webcast, thanks to ANI, CII, Aspen, and a couple of other organizations that have contributed to this evening. So I do want to acknowledge and if this is being webcast, the contribution of the Takshashila Foundation, Mr. Nitin Pai, and the Bharat Rakshak, Dr. Ramana, located in the U.S., who used to be in touch with Mr. Subramaniam on a regular basis. And there were a couple of others. There's a Brigadier Malik, now General Malik. And he used to often say to me that these are people who are giving me distance education. So the way we used to work, Mr. Subramaniam, would, he was an early morning man. He'd look at his emails, and by the time we came, the task force met, he'd already read most of the mails. Many of us barely are able to open the attachments, and he would be bursting with enthusiasm, and have you seen that, have you seen that? And many of us were people who were late into the night, and we were trying to catch up, so he had this thing about the distance education, and he used to always acknowledge this, so I thought I should formally, with the vice president's permission, acknowledge these people, and make two more observations, if I may, that... With Mr. Subramaniam, so much has been said about him. And, you know, there is actually a very positive celebratory aspect that has come, come about in, I would say, in different ways. There's also a lot of what I would call as this very innocent humor, or, you know, I would say the kind of responses that Mr. Subramaniam had. It was quite guileless. Perhaps that's the better word than innocent. And I think the Times of India people who may be sitting here, or others, you know, he became, as he often used to say, that his career in journalism started when he retired formally from the IAS, 1987, went to UK, came back. 1990, Mr. Subramaniam used to write for the BPO, media people here may remember, the Business and Political Observer. And almost day after day, 
they were these, I would say, very exhaustive pieces in those days, if I may say so, with due apologies to the editors and the management of media here. There was no word length. You know, the edit page was sacred. You could write 1,500 words, and Mr. Subramaniam held forth on various issues. And by the time he came to the Times, those of us who worked closely with him and with the media used to gently say that it was like a mild, affectionate sort of quip, that he's like Vamana, meaning that if you saw the Times of India edit page, there was something very sacred there called 345, you know, that was the lead article. Then there was a letters column, which used to be number six, and then there was seven, eight, which had the second lead. And below that, there used to be something called the middle, which had to be only 500 words, if I remember right. So Mr. Subramaniam would contribute to the editorial, the first edit. He would write three, four, five, and there was one day when there was also a middle by him about his hijacking experience. And that's when we used to say that Subhu has now become like Vamana. There's no part of the paper that, you know, does not have his footprint as it were. And on a lighter vein, if I may share this with my friends from the Times who are here, that was the time when on Indian television, Korn Banega Karodpati had become very popular. And the joke used to be that those who interacted with him, there was no fact that he did not know. I mean, you asked the question and Mr. Subramanian had the answer. So before Google, the joke used to be that you could go to Mr. Subramanian and ask him what happened in 1929 on Jan 14th. And Subhu sir would say that this, this has happened, but my memory is failing me. I can't remember if it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday. <laughs> I mean, this was vintage Subramanian. And then we'd say, sir, you must go to KBC. You know, you will get one crore. And imagine what we could do with one crore. And this is the central part. I thought I would just remind ourselves that with Subhu sir, it was objective assessment. Any situation, any sort of thing thrown at him, objectively assess it is what he would say and what he would do. So there was a very quizzical response from Mr. Subramanian saying, Kaun Manega Karodpati, I think I can go. I would know most of the answers, but I would trip up on the Hindi films. I don't know about that. <laughs> and that's when we would be told, sir, you could use a lifeline and so on and so forth. But I just thought that I would recall this. And one more aspect about him when I say this, guileless, but single-minded focus. Again, some of you remember that Mr. Subramaniam had many challenges, you know, to his health physically. Diabetes at a very young age, the family knows that history. Then he had a cardiac condition. And towards the end, he was also grappling with cancer. And there was one phase when Mr. Frank Wisner was the ambassador here, early 90s, and I think many people spoke about the anti-American posture that he had adopted in print. And it was this relentless logic that he brought to bear about the nuclear issue, why America is doing what it is, why India should not do CTBT, etc. And Mr. Frank Wisner, assisted by Mr. Matt Daly, the DCM were, you know, doing what American diplomats were expected to do in India at the time. And despite the fact that they had what I would call as the slightly uh, opposite sides of the equation, there was a very warm personal relationship. Mr. Subramaniam respected Ambassador Wisner, it was reciprocated. So Subhusar was in hospital. And we were concerned, you know, given his many frailties. But yet, he never missed a copy. I mean, those of you who remember, in the hospital, he would either dictate, or if health permitted, he would write this out in his typical longhand. And I've seen him, not once did he edit a piece. He would give it, and you know, it would go. So that particular day, Mr. Wisner called us and said, what's happened to Subhu? And we said, he's in hospital. So he said, I must go and see him. So this was pre-cell phone, pre-internet. So the ambassador and the DCM, flowers, etc., said, we must go and took him to the hospital where Mr. Subramanian was just recovering. So Frank Wisner has a bad knee. So he barely entered the room with this bouquet of flowers. And the first thing Mr. Subramanian says, Frank, have you read my article in the Times of India today? I'm sure you don't agree with me. <laughs> but this was the, as I said, single-mindedness and relentless logic. And as I said, towards the very end, very often, of course, he would talk about the national interest, Mr. Menon mentioned that, and various others. And he was, I would say, focused on the objective assessment. And he accepted dissent in our task force. There were so many issues that came up. People didn't agree with him. Some members of our task force are here. He would sit all around this table in the morning and say, gentlemen, the most important thing is to get 10 people around a table, objectively make an assessment, and then we can decide which way we should go. So it's in that spirit, you'll recall some of you in this audience, that a few years ago, after the task force had submitted its report, Mr. Subramaniam had encouraged some of us to start something called a small study group. It was nascent, 
and it then evolved into something else. And from the study group which he used to actually provide enormous support to on very macro issues of national security and national interest, it evolved into something else. So today as we were meeting, various people here said that when we say bye bye to Subhu sir, that it should be in a positive way, in a celebratory manner. Remember what he had done all his life, 50 years if not more. And one suggestion was that we would now create the equivalent of a Subhu forum. So if the family permits, we'll borrow that name ma'am and maybe in our own way, see how best we can take forward whatever Mr. Subramaniam had represented in his illustrious innings when he was contributing to various aspects of national endeavor. On that note, I thank all of you for being here, Vice President in particular, sir, for sparing time and being with us, and all of you, there are many people, I'm sorry I could not acknowledge, particularly Mr. Harban Singh, Mr. Subramaniam's batchmate, and others, as I said, I do apologize, but there will be another opportunity. Thank you very much. We have tea and coffee outside waiting for you. Thank you.